It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you tonight to Dr. Gregory A. Prince. Uh, I've known Greg for many years, and um, I can safely say that I consider him a friend. I can't say that, you know what he would say in return to that, but uh, we go way back in terms of the book, as one of my friends here tonight says, the book business. Um, and I am a big fan. Um, I've been reading the newest book, which uh, you came to mainly hear about tonight, Leonard Arrington and the Writing of Mormon History, uh, proudly published by the University of Utah Press. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent book in content and design, uh, and you're going to find out uh, some, some important things about it tonight. But, uh, but our hats are off to the University of Utah Press, who's done a, a, a great job with this book. Um, oh, hand me uh, David O. McKay. Where is he? Right here. Man, I'm right in here behind me. Um, <laughs> most of you are aware of Greg's book, David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism, which he co-wrote with uh, William Robert Wright. Um, and in my... Come on in. It does cost extra to sit at the front, but... Oh, not a photo. Okay, they're related. I knew, it. I knew there'd be a catch. Um, this is, uh, in my estimation, not only... What year was this published, Greg? 2005. 2005. Um, it's not only, well, I would consider it probably the greatest uh, Mormon biography of the 21st century, but certainly one uh, of, if you even look back to the 20th and 19th centuries, um, an enormously important book to understand contemporary Mormonism. Um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, award-winning, uh, as I'm sure the, the Leonard Arrington one will be as well. Uh, but if you have not read this biography, administrative biography of David O. McKay, you should definitely put it on your list. I happen to know a place you could get it to, really quickly. Um, Craig also did Power From On High, The Development of Mormon Priesthood. And by the way, the David O. McKay book, uh, it's also done by the University of Utah Press. This one was done by Signature Books, Power From On High. Excellent on the development of uh, Mormon priesthood and authority, the whole concept of authority that, uh, unlike has ever been done before. Um, it would be really corny if I were to say that he's a prince of a guy. Uh, but you have to remember that I'm a bench, and so I've been taking hits for my name all my life, too. Uh, but I am proud to say, just in case you haven't heard it before, I'm proud to be a son of a bench, <laughs> as was my father before me, and as is my son. Um, Greg uh, has authored these books, a number of articles, uh, and important scholarly pieces, um, <clears throat> Levina Feeling Anderson said this about the Leonard Arrington book. This biography breaks your heart a little, stiffens your spine a lot, and makes you fall in love with a man who may be his generation's best human being. Um, I'm not going to go into your medical background and all that, because I only care about the fact that you're an author. But um, Greg it actually has many degrees, I think dentistry and medicine and PhDs and all those other... Which makes him afford to be able to be a historian. Yeah, exactly. And I haven't seen it yet. I'm hoping he's going to fly me out there personally to see his library at his home. It's legendary though, but um, this man comes from a literary background and a and has made history his, I guess we could say, avocation, but you'd never know it. You would think that it's his profession uh, because of the quality of the, the writing and the research that, that Greg has done. And I've probably embarrassed him enough. Uh, I will now give you Greg Prince.
How's that work in the back? That, can you hear him in the back? Yeah. All right. If you can't hear him, raise your hand. <laughs> Some of you may know Paul Edwards of what's now the Community of Christ. When I gave my very first paper at a history meeting, which was in about 1987, uh, in the RLDS chapel across from the Curtin Temple, Paul introduced me and gave what I still consider to be the high water mark of introductions. He said, Greg Prince is a pathologist, which explains his interest in Mormon history, and he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has yet improved on that. <laughs> I, I want to give a shout out to a couple of pairs of people. Uh, Glenda and John, where are you? In the back. Glenda Condor, Cotter and John Alley, in the back corner, shepherded this thing through. Glenda is the editor-in-chief at the University of Utah Press. John Alley is one of the editors up there. Uh, they did it on time. They rushed to get it out for MHA, and I think they did just a magnificent technical job of turning out a very beautiful book, so thanks to you. And then Dean and Susan Madsen, wave your hands. Uh, I'll go into this in a little bit uh, as to why they made this book necessary. Uh, but I want to start by talking about something that happened 24 hours ago. When you live in Washington for four decades, you get to meet interesting people and you don't really have to try to meet interesting people. I was at a gathering a little bit smaller than this last night at Wesley Theological Seminary in DC and there were two panelists. One was David Gregory of CNN, formerly of NBC, for several years uh, after Tim Russert died. Uh, David was the host of Meet the Press on Sunday mornings. And the other was Mike McCurry, who was press secretary to Bill Clinton in the mid-1990s. And they were talking about faith in the public square. It was a most interesting discussion. But what really intrigued me was that they had come in their religious lives from two different directions to two different destinations. <coughs> David Gregory saying, I grew up as a secular Jew and only later in life made the journey to a Jew of faith. And Mike saying, I grew up as a devout Methodist and then moved in a secular direction and only later reattached my spiritual roots through the intellectual route. So one went from faith to intellect, the other went from intellect to faith. Leonard was intellect all the way through. He wrestled with the issues from his earliest days in college and wasn't content until he felt that he had won the wrestling match. Uh, it's not the only way to live one's spiritual life, and clearly I saw two other ways last night but it certainly is a valid way, and I think that's one of the lessons that Leonard left. For those who are wired in such a way that that's the way that they have to confront their religion, there's a way to do that, and he showed how to do it. Now, a little bit about how I got into this. Um, I have to go back to that first book, The Power From On High, which has been a runaway bestseller after 21 years. It's still in its first printing. Don't all rush out at once to buy it. <laughs> but as I was researching priesthood, having been an elders quorum president in Maryland for four years and having encountered a lot of questions for which I couldn't find answers in the published materials, uh, an unusual mission president was assigned to the D.C. area, Bob Wright unusual because he didn't react to some things that I was doing in the way that I might have expected. Uh, the first week in June, uh, shortly after he came into the mission, I guess it had been a year after because he came the first of July, I taught the priesthood lesson and I taught it on blacks and the priesthood because it was an anniversary year for that. I hadn't met Bob yet, but he was in our ward, and after the lesson he started to walk up the aisle, and I thought, I'm in trouble now because he's going to chide me for having discussed a controversial topic. He came up and he said, that was really interesting. He said, is there any way you could introduce me to this Lester Bush that you spoke of? So I knew that this was 
a, a man that I wanted to know more about. Your mentor? My mentor, yes, absolutely. Lester was and remains one of my closest friends uh, with our friendship stretching over 41 years now. But uh, we subsequently had Bob and Janet over for dinner several times, and I was researching and starting to write the priesthood book, so I gave him a couple of draft chapters because he said he was interested. He came back uh, after having read some of them, and he said, do you know the name Claire Middlemas? Well, I know that she was President McKay's secretary, but that's all I know. He said, well, she was my aunt. And she worked her entire career which was 35 years as President McKay's private <coughs> secretary, compiling a record of his life and his administration with the intent that she could be his biographer. But she didn't have the time as long as the president was alive, and shortly after his death, her health began to fail, so she never got around to writing anything. She had never married because that was the rule in those years if you worked at the church headquarters. Uh, and so she went to Bob, her favorite nephew, and said, I'm giving all of my papers to you. She didn't mandate that he write a biography, but it was implied. And so he said to me, I have your next book. Will you help me to write this biography? So that began a 10-year journey into the life of President McKay. Uh, very tragically, two years into that journey, Bob was diagnosed with early, uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease, the age of 59. Mm -hmm. So he, he was still alive and was fully aware of what was going on when the book came out, but his ability to contribute to it uh, tailed off significantly. When I finished the McKay book, my wife Jalen said, so what's next? And I said, I don't know, but it will find me. And it didn't take long. That book came out, as I recall, in March of 2005, and I think it was September of 2005 that I was invited to speak in the Logan Tabernacle about the book. Afterwards, a young lady approached me and said, I'm Susan Arrington Madsen. Are you staying overnight? Because if you are, rather than driving back to Salt Lake, could I meet you in town for breakfast tomorrow and speak to you about something? So. We had, I think it was about a three-hour breakfast meeting. And the bottom line of that in subsequent meetings was that she and her brothers, one of whom had served in Brazil with me in the Brazilian South Mission, uh, asked if I would consider doing Leonard's biography. So it only took a few months for the next one to find me. I really don't go looking for trouble usually, but it finds me quite easily. Uh, and how could I turn that down any more than I could have turned down the McKay biography? In the ecclesiastical world, President McKay was really the only figure that we knew. Uh, he was the pre well, I was two years old when he became the president. I had been back from my mission for about five or six months when he died. So in all of my formative years, he was the prophet. And it took a long time for me and I'm sure a lot of others of that era to get used to praying for anybody else except President McKay because that prayer was so deeply ingrained in our psyche. Leonard was of that same stature in my mind when it came to the world of Mormon history. He was at the top of the peak. So to be asked to write his biography uh, was an honor and there was no way in the world that I could have turned Susan down but Susan without you uh, this book at least would not have happened with my name as the author, so it, it took 11 years uh, of most of the spare time that I could scrounge up, but it was worth every hour, so thanks to you, and I hope those of you who don't know Susan will take the chance tonight to meet her and her husband Dean, and to at least bask in some of the reflected glory of the Arrington family. Now I want to draw a couple of lessons from the book. I'm not going to give you a book report. You'll be able to read it. But I think that there are some overarching lessons that I think are useful for us to talk about, and then I'll open it up to discussion. Uh, lesson number one is that Leonard's contribution was less what he wrote and more what he did. He described himself as an entrepreneur of history, and I think that was a very apt description. His books um, 
were a variable quality, largely because most of them were ghost-written. Once he became the church historian, he didn't have a lot of time to sit down and write books. His best book, in my estimation, and I think it's nearly a consensus, was his first book, Great Basin Kingdom. And I don't think that any of his subsequent books reached that level again. I think his Brigham Young biography was very good. Uh, I would put in second place, just by personal preference, his autobiography, which I thought was a wonderful book. Uh, but that was not what his legacy really will be. It's that he took in tow hundreds, and that's not an exaggeration, of people of various ages and genders and interests. They didn't have to be aspiring historians. He mentored them and gave them some purpose and direction in life that stayed with them so that the entire field of Mormon studies today is still heavily populated with people who, to a large extent, were deeply imprinted by Leonard. Let me just see by show of hands any of you who knew Leonard well enough to have been affected by him. There are significant numbers of hands going up here. And the second generation effect is the ripples on the pond. So that that's a legacy that is going to far outlive any of us in the room here. Um, the second theme is that Leonard was very welcoming of amateurs. I have been a research scientist in medical research for four decades. I've been to a lot of professional meetings. I belong to some professional societies. I've talked to professionals in other areas about their societies, and it's almost universal that professional societies are very clannish. They draw sharp boundaries, and you're either in or out, and there's no middle ground. I think, perhaps because of Leonard's own experiences, he was not only tolerant of the amateur, he was welcoming. One of those experiences was that he grew up outside of the Great Basin. He never lived in a majority Mormon community until he took a faculty position at Utah State University in 1946, which would have meant, what, uh, he was 29 by then? Yeah, or 1917, yeah. So he knew what, what it was like to be an outsider, and I think he had empathy for outsiders of any types because of that experience. The other experience was that Leonard, even though we talk about him being the only professional historian ever to be church historian, he wasn't a professional historian. His degree was in economics. He taught economics at Utah State for 26 years. He never taught history at Utah State. He could have taught history, but there was a rivalry there that shouldn't have existed with George Ellsworth, and George made sure that Leonard was never allowed to teach a course labeled history. So here we have a, a guy who really was on the outside in a couple of areas, and I think that sensitized him to the value of outsiders and what they could bring to the inside. When the Mormon History Association was formed in 1965, from the outset, all comers were welcome. Your credential was an interest in Mormon history. If any of you have been to any of the meetings of the Mormon History Association, you realize to this day that is still the atmosphere there. You don't have to be a writer of history, either articles or books. If you just express an interest in it that's enough to get you to the door, you're welcomed. That is a unique <coughs> legacy for a professional organization, and it goes right back to Leonard. The third of the three things that I want to talk about is a very simple statement that was on the masthead of the Times and Seasons, which was the church's newspaper in Nauvoo from 1840 to 1846. Did I get those right? Pretty much. Truth will prevail. And if you look at the longer scope of history that starts with when Leonard became the church historian in 1972 and comes to the present, you'll see what Martin Luther King talked about, that the arc of justice bends slowly, but it bends eventually in the direction of justice. What Leonard started is what Elder Snow and 
Reed Nielsen and the others in the church history department now are building upon. There is continuity of purpose and content even though there was a disconnect chronologically for a few years in between. What Leonard and his colleagues in what was then called the historical department started to do was the right thing to do. They were after the truth and they were writing the truth as men and women of faith. The timing was not quite right. There were some senior church officials who grew up in the old system that said the only purpose of history is to promote faith and we will define what the promotion of faith is. The new order that Leonard and his colleagues represented was not a threat to truth. It was a threat to the existing order. And that's where the clash came and that's where the disconnect occurred. And so from 1980 and for a couple of decades thereafter, the whole enterprise that Leonard had started looked like it had been dissolved and disappeared. The metaphor that I would like to put in front of you is that of the Salt Lake Temple. It was, uh, the groundbreaking was in 1853. By 1857, the excavation had been completed and a lot of the foundation stones had been laid. Then they got word that Johnston's army was coming from the east to restore order, and that became the beginning of what was called the Utah War. <coughs> Brigham Young was absolutely determined that the troops would not do violence to what the saints were trying to do. So they moved the people south, they moved the record south, they couldn't move the temple foundation south, so they covered it up to try to ob obliterate any trace of it so that the troops wouldn't even know <coughs> where it was. It remained covered up for several years after that. Then the time came to reinitiate the building of the temple. They dusted off the foundation. It proved to be quite an adequate foundation to support the magnificent building that now has been sitting there for over a century. I think that is really an apt metaphor for what happened with Leonard and the historical department. <coughs> they laid a solid foundation. The timing wasn't right. That foundation got covered up, and it got covered up for quite a few years. When it was dusted off, and, and you can correct me if I'm off base on this, Elder Snow, but I think it's proved to be a quite adequate foundation for what you and your department have done ever since. And we're greatly indebted to Leonard and to his co-workers for doing that. They got it right, and truth has prevailed. Uh, and if anything, Leonard, I think, would be in shock today to see what the Church Historian's Press is publishing. I don't think that he could have imagined that these things could have happened ever, given the climate that he operated in. And yet here it is. And if you look at, over this arc of time, there's the continuity between what they started and what now is being continued. So those are my introductory remarks. I'd like to hear from you and try to answer whatever questions or comments you've got. Please, somebody. <laughs> yes? Is this considered an authorized biography? Uh, the question is, is this considered an authorized biography? Susan, did you authorize it? Sure. It's authorized. <laughs> Are there perils to an authorized history, to the historian? Uh, I will say that I had not one instance where the family tried to interfere with what I was doing. They were totally supportive all along the way. I can't recall a single thing that you even asked me to change once I finished the manuscript. Mm. Neither Susan nor her brothers. And I can't think of anything. And Carl, I know, is a pretty severe critic, uh, and Carl's fine with He's the book. He's very pleased. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I, when I uh, finished the McKay book, the first talk that I gave on it was at the Marriott Library. They have a Sunday at the Marriott series for authors. <clears throat> and at the end of my remarks, um, Ed McKay, President McKay's oldest surviving son at that time, 
stood up and turned around and faced everybody. This was unscripted. He said, I just want all of you to know how pleased the McKay family is with this biography. So if you take a risk by doing uh, an authorized biography, uh, I took the risk twice. It seems to have turned out okay. There's another question here. Yes. You said that uh, Leonard was an intellectual all the way. Did you not think he was a man of faith? The, qu the question is, when I said that Leonard was an intellectual all the way, did I think he was not a man of faith? I think he was a man of faith, but the intellectual pathway was his pathway to get there. Yes. Now, he had three experiences, started, uh, going back to the time when he was a Boy Scout on a campout, that he characterized as epiphanies. None of those three related to his Mormonism. They all related to his relationship to the deity. So he had a strong conviction of the existence of God, not any type of denominational God. Uh, but his allegiance to the church, I think, was largely through his having read so much material and wrestled with the issues and come to his own conclusion on the basis of that intellectual wrestling, yes, this is it for me. This is the true church for me. Is that an adequate Well, I answer? read your book, and I felt like he was a man of faith as well. As oh, he was a man of faith. No, I, I don't question that, but it, it was the intellectual route for him. Okay. All the way. Susan, is that an adequate characterization? Well, yeah, I think he, uh, I think it was pointed toward Mormonism, uh, because he he had chosen, he was headed in that direction, he'd been doing a lot of research, and he made the statement uh, that he felt like God was saying, you're, you're, you're following the right path, you're doing the right <coughs> thing, continue on, yeah. you're, you're going to be involved with writing the story of my church, history of my church, I, that's my memory. Yeah. But there, there was a lot of intellectual struggle on his part. It wasn't just that he was reading a lot of things. He was saying in his diary and in other documents, I really struggled with these things. And on a couple of occasions when he was an undergraduate uh, at University of Idaho, he wrote in his diary, ah, I came up with the answer, and then a couple of days later he said, somebody shot that one down, so i got to start over. So what he wound up with was something that he owned. When Helen Whitney did the PBS documentary uh, nearly a decade ago on the Mormons that many of you probably saw, uh, I worked pretty closely with her for a couple of years. And towards the end of the, um, of the production, or producing of it, she called me and she said, I have interviewed hundreds of people of your faith. She said, it's a good faith. But too many of you borrow it. You need to own it. Leonard owned it, and you only own it one way, and that's by getting into the wrestling match and not just taking it on someone else's work. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can you name names? That is... You I'm having a bigger and bigger difficulty naming names. <laughs> I'm mean, 68. Name, <laughs> name some of the people that were against Leonard and some of them that were for Leonard. There was nobody who was against Leonard. They were against what Leonard represented. Well, name some names. <laughs> <laughs> the two principal antagonists were Ezra Tapp Benson and Mark Peterson, who also were two of the senior apostles. But it's, and I didn't say what I said facetiously. I don't know of anybody who disliked Leonard. Fair statement, Susan? Yeah. If you knew him, you loved him. He was just that kind of a person. I think of him as a hybrid between a teddy bear and a Santa Claus, both in his physical effect and in his personality. You couldn't dislike the man, but what he represented was a new world order. And therein was the clash. So it was a clash of the new world order versus the old world order. It was not a clash of personalities, even though it's hard when you're in the battle to separate those two, to separate the personality from the issue. These were all people of goodwill who were 
they were <clears throat> in a struggle to preserve what they felt was the right way to do things. That's where the battleground was. Had Leonard become a historian <coughs> 20 years later, we may have had a completely different outcome. So a lot of it was just the timing. Recall, Ezra Taft Benson and Mark Peterson were born near the beginning of the 20th century. I don't know if they went back into the 19th century. Do you recall reading? They, they were close. So these were men who grew up knowing some of the pioneers, knowing firsthand the stories of the persecutions. To them, it had been an us versus them world. Uh, Kurt mentioned my library. I've got over 10,000 volumes. Most of those volumes fall into two categories. We will prove that Mormonism is the one and only true church. We will prove that Mormonism is not the one and only true church, that it's the false church. It was a polemical world then. There was no middle ground. You really get into the middle of the 20th century before you start to get many books written that you can even call objective history. Everybody prior to that was choosing up camps. That's the world that those two men came out of. It was in their DNA. They were acting true to what their own heritage and their own worldview was. The unfortunate thing is that those two worldviews had to clash and that somebody had to lose, and the ones who lost were the ones who didn't hold the strings of power. It was that simple when it came right down to it. Yes? With respect to those antagonists, were there any specific issues or articles that Leonard or his entrepreneurs were kind of promoting that served as a tipping point where that it kind of really fueled the fire. Yes, that tipping point was the story of the Latter-day Saints. Read that book now and then ask yourself, so what's offensive here? But it's like Leonard. It wasn't the book and it wasn't Leonard. It's what Leonard represented. It's what the book represented. It was a different way of telling the history that didn't have basically God on every page behind every bush. If you compare the story of the Latter-day Saints with its predecessor, mm -hmm. Joseph uh, Fielding Smith's Essentials in Church History, mm -hmm. you see the difference. You see it immediately. The difference is what set them off. And so the, the tipping point was the publication of the story of the Latter-day Saints. Okay. But it wasn't the content. In fact, both men said, and Leonard recorded it in his diary, that they hadn't read it. They had read excerpts that some of their assistants had provided for them, duly annotated, underlined. Is that? Yeah, that's fair. Yes? Uh, it seems like uh, a few years ago there was a contest over some of the Arrington papers up at Utah State University. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and correct me if I've got the story wrong, but there's kind of uh, the church took some of the papers and the rest, I think, went to the family. Were you able to access the papers that the church uh, took possession of? Well, <clears throat> my knowledge of it is... Craig, will you repeat it? Yes, the question was, at, after Leonard's death, his papers became an issue. Now, by terms of his will, the papers, which amounted to over 300 linear feet, and think about that, that's much of what's in this room, went to Utah State University. When those were curated and open to the public, there was a dispute with church people saying, some of those don't belong there, they belong to the church. And initially, the claim was about this much, figuratively speaking. What eventually happened was that about this much went back to the church, because when everybody got around the table and examined all the documents, the agreement was, no, he didn't violate anything, and in fact, this much can stay up there. What was in this much were basically two documents <clears throat> that Utah State felt uh, clearly belonged to the church and were of a confidential enough nature that they should go back to the church with no copies remaining up there. Now, all of those, with the exception of Leonard's diaries, were open to the public well over a decade ago. I don't recall the date. That the, that the collection minus the diaries was open to the public, but it's quite a while ago. 
Susan, as the trustee of Leonard's estate, uh, was able to give me access to the diaries before they were made available to other scholars. The diaries now, for several years, have been open to the public uh, up at Utah State as well. So th there were no restrictions on anything that I wanted to look at. And, uh, and none of the things that I looked at are restricted for anybody else to look at. It was a complete enough record uh, that I didn't really have to go very far outside of that. The whole book consists mostly of what's in his papers and the interviews that I did that provide the third dimension on telling the story. Yes? Can you talk about the effect that, that his dismissal as, as church historian had on, had on him personally? Was it, was it a really traumatic experience? Or did he sort of the question it? is, <clears throat> what was the effect on Leonard personally of his dismissal as church historian? Uh, he was devastated, but he was devastated for two reasons, and it, it's hard, it's, it's not possible for me to pull those apart and say how much was one and how much was the other. One is just that what he had dreamed of and tried to do for a decade clearly had slipped away. He, he, was, he was very stoic in talking about that, and I found very few people to whom he'd said anything about it, and some of them were his closest friends. One who did say something was Bob Flanders. <clears throat> Bob grew up in the RLDS church and basically was shunned out of it for his uh, dissertation, which became a book, uh, Nauvoo Kingdom on the Mississippi, 1967, something like that. Uh, they didn't like, they meaning his religious tradition, didn't like that he discussed polygamy because to them it never existed. Uh, so he left their tradition but uh, remained within that larger orbit of Mormon studies. And when I interviewed <clears throat> Bob, he said, I was asked by Leonard one day when I was in Salt Lake, can you ride down to Provo with me? And, and he said it sounded like more than just a request. And so I, I went with him, and on the way he said, Bob, um, they're undoing everything that I've worked for. That was the single most poignant example that I saw of him letting it out that he was devastated by that. But the other thing that I suspect was even a greater tragedy for him was that within weeks of when they finally took the, play, the plaque off the wall and everybody was sent packing, his wife Grace died. She had been in a long decline health-wise. And, and how do you separate the effects of those two when they were happening simultaneously? So the, <clears throat> the net result was that he really was devastated. You can track his diary and, and the quality just falls off the cliff. Once Grace died, uh, it became mostly a scrapbook and the real historical content was largely the weekly letters that he wrote to his children. But daily diary entries pretty quickly disappeared. His heart just wasn't in it anymore. Hmm. Yes? When you compare your experience writing the McKay book and the Arrington book, given what has happened on the net and given what has happened with the church uh, coming up with all of these controversial topics and being quite uh, much more transparent about them, uh, when you compare your experience writing the two books, can you can you talk about how that experience differed in terms of what was going on in the church at the time? Actually, my experience with both books was uh, quite remarkably positive. Uh, because of the depth of Leonard's own record, I never went to the church archives because I already had it. For the McKay book, I couldn't have been treated better <clears throat> at the church archives. And that was at a time when not everybody might have given the same report. My experience was that it was, uh, it was very good, that I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was allowed to see some things that normally were restricted, and I went through the regular channel of write something, make your case, and we'll 
fronted up the chain of command. That had to do with some of the oral histories that provided really crucial information, particularly about the early 1960s. Uh, and about a third or more of the restricted oral histories that I requested, <coughs> I was allowed to see. <clears throat> so uh, I was given great uh, cooperation by the church archivists. I also interviewed um, most of the remaining uh, active duty or um, emeritus general authorities who had been called by President McKay and got what I felt were remarkably candid interviews from them. So uh, the internet, it turns out, didn't really have any effect on the way that I approached the two books. If I were doing the Joseph Smith book now, or the, the priesthood book, which is really a Joseph Smith book, um, <clears throat> I would have access via the internet to things that I couldn't have dreamed of having access to 20 plus years ago. Is that an adequate answer? It's a true answer. That helps. Yes, one way in the back. Gary. Could you tell us about some of your favorite I think my favorite uh, were with the Arrington family. I love the interview with Leonard's sister, Marie. Uh, and one of my favorite stories was her talking about when Leonard was a pre-teenager and he was getting involved in Future Farmers of America and didn't have great oratorical skills, but now as he was moving through the leadership of FFA, um, he was required to give speeches. She said he'd go out to the chicken house and he'd practice his speeches in front of the chickens. <laughs> I guess that's like Demosthenes putting pebbles in his mouth, but it worked because he was quite a good orator. Um, the funniest one that I had was with James, and that won't surprise Susan. Uh, James and I knew each other in Brazil, but we never worked in the same city together. Uh, when I went over to tape the interview with him, because we had that common background, we started the discussion here and not here, and he was just an absolute hoot, talking about what happened, but putting it in a way that almost had me rolling on the floor with laughter. Uh, that was my most memorable of all of the interviews. And he got good content in there as well. Yes? Did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Yes, Leo? Did you have any other sources that were critical of him. The guy sitting here is a little worried about that in the book. Um, I think you'll you, see... You repeat that, yeah, you? did I have any sources that were critical of him? I think you'll see it both in the McKay book and in the Arrington book. I don't try to steer the discussion away from, uh, from soft spots or blind spots at the head. I think that as a biographer, it's my job to try to tell as complete a story as I can and to put it in a context that's going to help the reader understand what was going on. So the people who were critical of Leonard, and there weren't many of them, but their criticism was his scholarship as it came out in his writings was very well, too nice a guy to really tell the whole story. Well, that plus the quality decreased over time because he didn't have time to put his personal imprint on it, and so some of the scholarship and some of the, the writing was sloppy. And I had several people comment on that. I had others who worked with him who were upset that he didn't put their name as a co-author. He might put them in the acknowledgement. Sometimes he didn't even do that. Uh, having spent four decades in scientific research, I know some of the struggles that go on to determine authorship of papers because I published about 150, and, and I'm anywhere from first to last author and everything in between. But those were the two main criticisms that I heard, and thinking about how long he was doing this and how big an output he had, um, it's valid criticism, but Any it, it didn't Any critics I know loved him yep. deeply. Yep. yep. They, they were not critical of him as a person. That criticism had to do with the scholarship. Yes. Do you have? Are you open? Two questions. Are you open to the idea of writing another biography or book? I know, right? It's kind of a dirty question. And then number two, if you could pick, because it'll probably find you. If you could pick, would you have any grab bag of 
Man, I would love to tell this. I would that. not dare to say who I would like to write about. <laughs> oh, the question was if if I are you are you open? Am I open idea? to a third biography? Um, yeah. Would your wife like it? No. <laughs> okay. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, and nobody has approached me yet. Don't get any ideas as a result of this evening. Uh, I've been doing this writing stuff now for 30 years, and have three books to show for it. I got other things to do. I won't quit writing though. Yes. Um, it's been an interesting time. Um, as I was reading kind of your introductory parts of your book on a Sunday evening, I stopped because I recall that I haven't been a good, you know, person keeping a diary. So I had to stop. And I spent about an hour Sunday evening, kind of the past two years, doing the cliff notes of what's happened in my life, how I view certain things that have happened in, in society the past two years. Um, not that I want to be, heaven forbid, I become prominent, but because I, I need to worry about my personal history. And then yesterday, a friend of mine announced that she's collecting um, personal essays of what it means to be Mormon and single. Um, for an anthology that she's working on. So I, I spent yesterday evening writing up a personal essay and submitting that. So what I get at is, from your perspective, what can all of us civilians do to help historians in the future have an accurate understanding of what's happening today? Like what, what Did you plant that question? <laughs> <laughs> It's an excellent question. Both of these books relied heavily on diaries. Diaries are, in my opinion, the most important historical document. Reed, you willing to at least sign on and part to that? I agree with that. Yeah. But enough for the next generation that doesn't have them from us. Yes, and, and, and the paradox now of the internet world in which we live, it has never been easier to keep a diary. You get voice recognition software, all you need to do is dictate it, it's on your computer, you print it. The paradox is we probably have fewer people than ever before who are keeping diaries. And that's the part of history that I think is one of the most crucial parts. With due respect to the big level histories, uh, I think that the real story of this church, and maybe of many other organizations and even countries, it's not the great men, as it were in the old times, or even great men, great women, great events history. It's what was going on down here in the trenches. That's the glue that held this church together. <clears throat> Some of us have, as they say, south of here, roots in St. George. Uh, and the only way you could survive down there was to be pretty tough stock. It was the, the people in the trenches down there who stuck it out, who held the church together much more than the leaders up here. Am I mis misstating that, Steve? Well, I'm biased, so... Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but that's the story that doesn't get kept up here. So when you ask me, what can we do, my answer is keep your own record. Tell the story of your life. It's going to be of value <clears throat> more than you would imagine. If you have a family, it will certainly be of value to them. But you get a collection of these going, and suddenly you have a database. Think of, of what the database would be. I've done almost a thousand oral histories on the projects that I've worked on. If I had a thousand oral histories that were taken in 1850 in Salt Lake, oh, you'd, you'd rewrite history. And I think that's the history that the historians more and more are gravitating towards, and I think it's the history that readers are more and more appreciative of. It's the social history. It's what went on. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to have an anthology that would say, in the 1840s, here is what a sacrament meeting actually looked like and then the 1850s and the 1860s I don't know anybody right now who could give me that answer but that would be a fascinating thing to read but that's not going to come out of the institutional records it's going to come out of the individual records so yeah that's what you could all do um, Kurt I don't want to overstay the welcome no, you're, you're good.
how long are you planning this to go? Oh, until the first person passes out? At least till 10. Yeah, at least till 10. Yes. 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 No, because that was in the mid 1960s, and that was before, Leonard was up in Logan doing economics, and that was down at BYU in political science. No, now you may have known two generations of Wordlands. I'll bet you didn't date Richard Wordland's secretary, but I did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, not directly. The question is, do I relate to Leonard Arrington's intellectual path? And the reason I say that is, he was trained as an economist. He handled data sets this way. The historian is going to be trained this way. I'm a biologist, and that's the tools that I bring to it, for better or for worse. So I look at data this way and work upstream from there. I'm always either trying to do the experiment or at least looking at the data points as the result of an experiment that I didn't do and then piece together the story from that. So our methodology was different enough that no, I, I didn't view the intellectual pathway the same way that he did. Take your pick as to whether one is better than the other. Yes? You were saying that um, Leonard Arrington received opposition because of what he represented. And uh, after he was dismissed, I, I kind of heard different dates given about when his dismissal was official, about whether that was changing of his title to a head of the division of history or something like that. Anyway, um, and I also had heard, I think Davis Pitton might have said that his picture had been taken down for a time in the official lineage of church historians. Um, so my question is, when did what Leonard Arrington represented become respectable again? Let me answer your first implied question, and that is, when did he cease to be what he had been called to be? And the answer is, take your pick. Could have been 1980, it could have been 1982. In 1982, he went to the first presidency and said, uh, was I ever really released? Because he was sustained in general conference on the front end but he was never released on the back end, hmm. and so they wrote him a letter and made his release date retroactive, I think, by two years. So that's why I say you can take 1980 or you can take 1982. As far as the picture, yeah, um, it was up and then it was down, but let me talk about that briefly, I hope, but I hope I get the point across on this. When Leonard came in, it was in the middle of a grand restructuring of the church bureaucracy. It wasn't just the historical department. The church had brought in an eastern consulting firm and said, reevaluate this from top to bottom because it's unwieldy, and it was. It had sprung up from all of these fiefdoms and independent um, auxiliary organizations. It was large enough now that it needed to be restructured because it was sagging administratively. So the restructuring of what had been the church historian's office was part of this 
grander reorganization. When they did that, one of the recommendations was to professionalize the church historian's office. In doing that, they created three divisions, library, archives, history. They later added a fourth, which was arts and arts sites, and arts sites. and museums, arts and sites initially with Florence Jacobson as the division head there. But they started with those three. So Leonard's, one of his titles was Director of Church History Division. And Don Schmidt was Director of Archives. And, help me, uh, Library was... Earl Olson. Earl Olson. And then Florence Jacobson. Florence came in later, a couple of years later, yeah. But they also gave Leonard the title of Church Historian. And therein was the problem. Prior to that, you had a general authority, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve most of the time, who for the past half century had been Joseph Hilding Smith, who was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve and church historian. And under him, the church historian's office functioned. Now you had two apostles as the advisors to the church historical department. You had another general authority, Alvin Dyer, as the executive director of the historical department. Then you had three division heads and later four. But here Leonard has as his second title what used to belong up here. See the, see the problem? And that created and to this day creates confusion. Leonard didn't preside over anything up here. He was the director of this one of four divisions within the historical department. And so you can argue it each way. You can say, well, his picture belonged on the wall because he was church historian. But if you look at the other men who were church historians, they were up here and he was down here. So tell me which way you want it. But, but that, it was an unfortunate, I think, misnomer. He should have remained with the single title, Director History Division. And then the problem would never have arisen. And he would have been able to do everything administratively he did anyway. Legal. Shouldn't you say that he had some very good supporters in the top of the hierarchy, more personal, but were guiding him a little bit? Uh, the question is, sh shouldn't you say that he had some supporters higher up in the hierarchy? Absolutely. He was called by Eldon Tanner, who at that time was the second counselor in the first presidency. Joseph Fielding Smith was still the president of the church when Leonard was called, but from the time Leonard was uh, was sustained in general conference, it was only two months until Joseph Fielding died. The power behind the throne was Harold B. Lee. One of the surprises for me was how actively <coughs> supportive President Lee was of what Leonard was doing. I hadn't realized that, and I wouldn't have thought it knowing what I thought I knew about President Lee. Um, he was very, very supportive, even down into the weeds, of the things that Leonard was doing, of the expectations that President Lee had of what the historical department would produce. Leonard had frequent meetings with the First Presidency during that brief year and a half period when Harold B. Lee was the church president. Uh, and so he had that direct contact. As soon as President Lee died, things changed. Uh, Leonard never had a meeting with the First Presidency after that, during the entire time that President Kimball was president. It's not that President Kimball was against history. He, in fact, was very supportive. He was thrilled that Leonard had written the biography of, I think it was his grandfather, wasn't it, Edwin Woolley? Uh, and he was thrilled with the uh, Brigham Young biography that Leonard did. Uh, and he, you know, he prodded him, saying, please write it before I die. But he had other primary concerns. And his main concern was the missionary program. So it was benign neglect of the historical department and ultimately, that didn't overrule the influence of Ezra Taft Benson and Mark Peterson. And at the same time, <laughs> President Kimball's health was deteriorating so that when, when the uh, history division was dissolved uh, between 1980 and 1982, President Kimball was moving into the zone where he was no longer really functioning. And so he was totally incapable at that point of trying to to turn back history. Yeah. 
Uh, what kind of relationship existed between uh, Alvin R. Dyer and uh, Arrington? Excellent. Excellent. Dyer was, I think, as actively supportive of what Leonard was doing as President Lee had been. But there's a double tragedy there. Everybody assumed that Harold B. Lee would be the church president probably for 20 years because he was young at age 73 when he became president. But he only lived for a year and a half. Dyer was everything that Leonard would have wanted in an ecclesiastical leader directing the historical department. Within, I think it was five or six months, he had a stroke that was completely debilitating to him and he was never able to resume his responsibilities there. And so eventually Joseph Anderson was placed in uh, as the direct line report. Anderson turned out to be a pleasant surprise for Leonard. His memory went back a thousand years and he would sit around and talk about all of these things that had happened. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, how would you suggest, uh, influenced by, by Leonard's approach, teaching church history to a son with Asperger's and just kind of generally the church youth. Um, especially for, for me, I guess, I live in a, in a small town and um, so, so some of the ways that are taught are more the old school ways. And so how do, we, how do you bring in this, this new way of thinking? Okay, there, there are two questions there. One is, uh, I'll put them in reverse order. One is, how do you teach youth about church history? The other is, how do you teach a son with Asperger's? Um, I have a son who is profoundly autistic, so I get it. Uh, he's not at a level of even understanding this stuff, so it's a non-issue for us. But with Asperger's, which is on the high end of the autism spectrum, they live in a very concrete world. Abstract notions are very difficult for them to assimilate, and generalization is very difficult. Um, Asperger's is one of the areas where we are at greatest risk of losing real talent because intellectually very often these people, usually boys because there's about a five to one ratio of boys to girls with anybody on the autism spectrum, um, they can function intellectually at a very high level but socially very often they can't get to first base. And if you want a real example of somebody high functioning with Asperger's, think of Bill Gates. Um, who has Asperger, and he did pretty well in life. So, but to function socially, you have to memorize social scripts, and then move a half degree and memorize another one and move a half degree because they lack the ability to generalize. So those are your challenges if you're trying to get across not just the history, you know, the facts they can get. They'll get that probably better than you will. It's how do you assemble that and put it into a context that then translates into something about faith. Because faith is something that's going to be difficult for them to grasp. That's an abstract notion. They don't do well with that. So um, it's going to be a lot of, all right, we're going to memorize this script, and then we're going to move a little bit here and here and here, and then you're going to try to tie it together, but recognize that the the lack of ability to do abstract thinking and to generalize is going to be a severe impediment for you as the teacher. Uh, I, I don't want to hold people longer because it's a warm evening. quickly on teaching youth in the church. Trust. Oh, and teaching youth. Um, yeah, the other question. And then we'll let, we'll let that be the last one. We'll let, um, yeah, give me the easy one to end with. <laughs> when I was elders quorum president, it was at a time in Maryland where we had quite a few convert baptisms. And I found pretty quickly that the core members that I least had to worry about were the converts. I could take them anywhere, conceptually. They were pliable. They weren't so set here that if you moved them here, the foundation would crack. I think the same thing is true about youth in the church today. I think they can handle anything, but don't tell them an untruth, because in an internet age, they'll expose you in five seconds and then you're done. You have lost your credibility with them. You can walk them through anything. There's not a single topic in our doctrine, in our history, 
that you can't walk them through successfully, but you have to be their guide because there are landmines out there. If you can na navigate those landmines, they'll do fine. But tell them the truth and don't tell them untruths because especially with social media, with the internet, you can't do that anymore. They will call you out immediately and then you're toast. You won't have credibility. Well, thank you all for your attention on a warm evening. Can I ask one more question? You know, well, this, is okay, Leonard's, okay. Now, this is Leonard's granddaughter, so we got to give him that. All right. So back to your in the trenches comment. Yes. With your 11 years of studying and research, what would you say are some of your lessons that you have learned personally from Leonard in his life? Great question. Uh, I, I think his willingness to follow the trail wherever it led. I don't see that this was somebody who feared going where others feared to go. Um, in fact, one of the stories that James, your uncle, told me, he, he said, my father came to me once early in his career as church historian, and he said, James, I talk to people all of the time in congregations. I just don't feel like I'm quite connecting. And he says, okay, Dad, I know what your problem is. He said, the next time you talk, you're talking about history, he says, at the end, I want you to lean over the podium a little bit. I want you to take off your glasses, and I want you just to talk to him and say, I've seen everything that there is, and it's okay. <laughs> and he, he said, I watched the first time Dad did that, and he was nervous, but he did it, and he got it. And from that point on, he was okay. Uh, as a scholar, he had gone down that trail. What James was saying is, let them know now what's at the end of the trail. And I think that was that was the nicest lesson that I learned from it. Thank you. Very cool. What are the chances that that question from over here could would be directed to somebody who has a medical background and church history. That's pretty good. <laughs> nice segue. Um, I, I had failed, because I failed to see him, I, I didn't um, recognize Elder Stephen Snow, who is the church historian and recorder that's with us tonight, and it's a pleasure to have him with us. Uh, you, you have big shoes to fill, don't you? Very big shoes. <laughs> Very big shoes. Um, Really quickly, I, I wanted to mention, I just thought of this tonight, that uh, Leonard died in, was it 99? Yes. Uh, in 1998, I believe, is when Adventures of a Church Historian came out, if I remember right. We had him here for a signing, uh, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, if you don't mind, let me share a really quick anecdote uh, with myself, with uh, Leonard Arrington, when his book... The Mormon Experience came out, co-authored with Davis Bitten, I think it was 1979, toward the end of the 70s. Um, he came in, I was at Deseret Book Company at the time, and he came into the store, which he frequently did, and wanted to know where his book was. Oh, I shouldn't be telling this with Elder Snow here, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so he... <laughs> Too late. <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. I'm fried. Um, anyway, he wanted to know where his book, The Mormon Experience, was in the store where we were keeping. And I said, well, actually, Leonard, uh, it's in the back room with No Man Knows My History with the anti-Mormon <laughs> stuff. We've, we've been directed to keep it with uh, the anti-Mormon books. And he, you, Susan, I mean, you know his laugh. And he just roared over that. Uh, and I said, no, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, but every time he would come in, he'd say, well, I want to see that anti-Mormon book, Mormon Experience. He just got the biggest kick out of that. And so did I. Um, to let you know, uh, if you don't already, the uh, Leonard Arrington diaries are being worked on and will be published. Um, Gary, do you have any kind of update, or can you tell us anything? About his diary. Say again. This fall. Okay, I know 
Gary Bergera, Smith Pettit Foundation has no connection whatsoever to Signature Books, so he has to defer to them. It's an inside joke. Um, anyway, he's our go-to guy. Whatever, whatever he does, we like Gary.